What's up, Cole? How was, uh, did you work today? How was trucking? Oh, what's up, Smek? I know that name. What's up, Calvin? What's up, Arthur? What's up, Sicko Fox? What's up, Tyler? Thank you all for joining. What's up, other Tyler? Hello to you, too. Hello, Skanda. Hello, yeah. Okay, that's the same Tyler. I thought for a second we already had three Tylers in here. Uh, hey, Michael. Hey, Alex. Uh, hey, Ryan. What's up, Lex? What's up? I'm going to uh, be charitable and th assume that that's not pronounced Kissinger. Uh, what's up, KL Singer? Um, oh, cool. Yeah, 12 hours at work. That's nice, Cole. At least she got some overtime. What's up, Melissa? Uh, what's up, Kelsey? See, Kelsey didn't even know this was happening. That's why you subscribe, folks. You're going to get that alert. You're going to get that alert in case you've been neglecting your social media or your participation in the Minion Death Commandos Facebook group. You're going to get that notification that we're going live. What's up, the Dark Pope? I, I want to see that series. Enough of this young Pope, all right? What happens when the the Pope gets uh, black-pilled? Hey, Joe. Miss you. Uh, what's up, Superbus? What's up, Conrad? How's everybody doing tonight? Well, thank you. Hey, Melissa, if I didn't already say hi to you. I'll say hi again. It's no big deal. <clears throat> hey, Kevin. I think this reading will make up for the fact that uh, my Antifa lover had zero sex scenes. <laughs> Somebody asked me, I can't remember where it was, maybe on Twitter or in the group, if this book, Rodham, uh, had more of like a sexual power behind it than my Antifa lover. And... It like took me aback because I was thinking, I was like, where, what was the sex in my Antifa? Like I have an extremely bad memory. I don't know if you've listened to uh, the latest Patreon episode, <laughs> but like there was like uh, several times where I just could not remember anything. Uh, and I couldn't remember any sexiness to my Antifa. I remember them like laughing and eating breakfast and then possibly like sharing a bed or something. Uh, yeah, this book will more than make up for the lack of sex scenes in My Antifa Lover. Do not worry. What's up, Kirsten? What's up, Brockton? What's up, Fat Mox? What's up, Sylvie? What's up, Vegan Lumps? Yeah, this this is going to be the smuttiest read, like... I don't know if YouTube will allow it, frankly. What's up, vegan snossages? What's up, Ani? What's up, Benjamin? What's up, Lee? Thank you very much. I feel handsome. Uh, what's up, Kelly? Okay, so Sicko Fox asks, uh, what was the topic for the last episode this week? Was it the topic for the newest Patreon one? No. Okay. Uh, the new the Patreon episode was just its own thing. Uh, the last episode, I don't want to spoil it because we might do it. I might be like stable enough emotionally and mentally to attempt re-recording an episode 
Uh, but the episode that we recorded Sunday night, almost like 95% of the way through, and then my software froze up, deleted the episode. Uh, I will just say that both topics involved Louisiana cops. Coincidentally, I just saw two amazing things that both involved cops from Louisiana. And it was a fun time. It was a fun time that was just completely ruined. Uh, but you know what happens. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll reattempt it. What's up, Alexandria? What's up, Keith? What's up, Sonny? So, uh, tonight's episode is, uh, of course, about uh, a, a novel, a historical fiction, a bio biographical fiction called Rodham. Uh, written by a woman named Curtis Sittenfeld. Okay, don't be fooled by the name. Uh, women can write awful material too, you misogynists. Um, I am not a Hillary Rodham Clinton uh, historian, aficionado, specialist. I'm not knowledgeable about... I just know like the hits, you know? I, I know like the, the main bullet points. So the first half of this book is like basically, or the first third, I should say, is basically supposed to be what happened leading up to her deciding not to marry Bill. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about, or what I'm going to be reading from, is like based on a real timeline. And so I'm not, of course, not going to read all this bullshit. I'm just going to read the hits from the book. Uh... If I, I'm going to summarize between these like excerpts that are these cursed, these, these like cursed little peaks, uh, of the writing, I'm going to summarize like what leads up to what, if you, if, if I say anything that's like completely outlandish that needs to be corrected, uh, feel free to let me know. That's what I'm saying. Uh, what's up rat King. <laughs> Yeah, it is very weird. Kirsten W. says, fanfic about real people is so weird. Uh, it is. It's very fucking weird. Um, I One of the things that I'm very curious about is why this was written. I still don't quite know why it was written. It's very weird. I actually have a copy of it. Thanks to uh, an anonymous benefactor, I have a hard copy of Rodham that we did. No money uh, went to anybody for me to procure this. And Tony, I don't know if you saw what I posted on... Uh, Twitter, but Tony already ate some of it. I don't know. I don't know if you can see that. I gotta wait for the stream to catch up. Tony was eating it, and I was like, "Good boy. Very good." Oh, the focus is all off. Okay, so there's like corner, the, he ate the corners of the pages. Uh, but then once I started leaving my tabs, marking like the segments I wanted to read, I couldn't let him destroy it anymore because he wants to eat the tabs. So, uh, There's not going to be an HBO adaptation of this. There is going to be a Hulu adaptation of this. Uh, what's up, Elizabeth? Thank you for joining. What's up, David? Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think, I think maybe I can begin. Okay. So we're familiar with uh, the idea of historical fiction, right? What if uh, the Soviets hadn't won World War II for the Allies? Uh, what if America was founded on a matriarchy instead of a patriarchy and just a, uh, a, a spiked stiletto heel was uh, s squashing my testicles for the last uh, you know few hundred years? Um, what if the Irish hadn't been enslaved? Well, today we are addressing another what... Um, what, what the inner jacket says is a deeply compelling what might have been. What if Hillary Rodham hadn't married Bill Clinton? Um, without further ado, I'm going to flip to, I don't know what this type of page is called. What's the page where it's just like uh, artistic splooge? Where it's just like you know, if you want to put a put a little quote in there, it's not even like the uh, the dedication. It's not the dedication page. It's just like here are some quotes that maybe like set the tone for the work, right? Uh, the first quote is, "My marriage to Bill Clinton was the most consequential decision of my life. I said no the first two times he asked me, but the third time I said yes, and I'd do it again." Hillary Rodham Clinton what happened the second quote is the world has no right to my heart Lin-Manuel Miranda Hamilton it's not a joke that's right there I'm just showing everybody I don't it's, it's inscription yeah maybe I think it's inscription is normally like handwritten uh, yeah there's a there's a Lin-Manuel Miranda quote uh, on the first page of this thing um, and I think the quote is interesting the world has no right to my heart um, yeah so <clears throat> this is the prologue May 31st 1969 there was a feeling I got before I spoke in front of an audience and sometimes also before an event that was less public but still important, an event that could, have, that could have consequences in my life. Taking the LSATs, for example, which I'd done in a classroom on the campus of Harvard. The feeling was a focused kind of anticipation. It was like a weight in my chest, but it never exactly came from being nervous. So immediately we see that this is written from the perspective of Hillary Clinton. Quote, Hillary Rodham, right? This is a first person historical fiction. This is literally like, boy, I never thought my life would turn out this way <laughs> about a, a real person who written in a fake way. Okay. The feeling was uh, a focused kind of anticipation. Uh, it was like a weight inside my chest, but it never exactly came from being nervous. I always had prepared, and I always knew I could do it. Thus, the feeling was a sense of my own competence, blended with the knowledge that I was about to pull off a feat most people thought, correctly or not, they couldn't. And this knowledge contributed to the final aspect of the feeling, which was loneliness. The loneliness of being good at something. So, in uh, Curtis Sittenfeld's mind, uh, Hillary Clinton is just like constantly applying for a job where she has to say, so "What's you? What's your greatest weakness?" Oh, I would say uh, I'm too lonely because of my brilliance. I would say uh, there's a there's a weight in my chest that has to do with how competent I am at all times. <laughs> like I love this. This is like this is like the liberal wine mom version of of Rick from Rick and Morty. Like someone who's just jaded and miserable because of how in that because of that feeling when so intelligent, you know. 
um, like I, I, this made me wonder while I was reading this, I bet you somewhere out there, whether it's a tweet, whether it's a blog, whether it's like a medium post, somebody has speculated about like Hillary Clinton, uh, having autism, like being slightly autistic. And that's why she's so brilliant. And that's why she comes off so cold and calculating. It's because she can't she can't be bothered with with the the niceties of of interpersonal communication or maybe she's she just doesn't understand them and she's on a high you know like that weird objective way people talk about autism like you know like oh sherlock holmes uh some people have theorized that the the fictional character sherlock holmes was autistic <laughs> like that i i bet you there's writing about hillary clinton like that and just reading this that's like that's what it was she was just so lonely because of how uh, how that feeling went too intelligent. So that's just like this book starts off with her her speaking at uh, Wellesley, the Wellesley graduation, being the first student to speak. I listened to some audio of it. Uh, it's it's a it's a good speech. It's a little vague, but uh, you know it's it's like protest is good. Out with the old guard, in with the new. That's that's sort of like liberal. Uh, the next generation will save us kind of speaking. Um, we are fast forwarding to her first date with Bill Clinton. Uh, we've gone through a lot of like her home life and her like uh, how alienated she felt at, you know, elementary school and high school and that sort of thing. The, the, um, the misogyny that she, you know, most likely did encounter uh, on on various campuses at various points in her life, even in, in her own home. Um, Bill Clinton has like schmoozed her at Yale. They're at Yale at this point. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's big dick on campus, uh, and he noticed her and wanted to ask her out. So we have here a passage. Between the letter signing and the potluck, I was meeting Bill at three. When I arrived at the cafe, he was waiting outside. He cocked his head to the right and said, I have a better idea. I passed the art gallery on the way here. You interested in the Rothko exhibit? The gallery isn't open, I said. Because of a labor dispute, several buildings were currently closed. Exactly, he said. Want to see me work some American Saw magic? I forgot I was going to try to do the Bill Clinton voice. Okay, so they were meeting for a date. Leading up to this date, she was like, what would what would Bill Clinton possibly want with me? Right? I'm just a fuddy-duddy. I'm just a, a man in woman's clothing sort of thing. What could he possibly want with me? Uh, and then Bill says... You know, let's go to this Rothko exhibit. And she says, the gallery isn't open because of the labor dispute. Meaning there's a strike going on. Several buildings were currently closed because there's a strike going on. Exactly, he said. Want to see me work some Arkansas magic? Which I'm assuming is just going to be like passing all the the nation's second right to work law. <laughs> uh, so, blah, blah, blah. On his way to meet me at the cafe. So they go, they go to the Rothko exhibit. And there's, a, there's like a lone security guard, right? And he won't let him in. On his way to meet me at the cafe, Bill had noticed that trash had accumulated in the gallery courtyard, meaning like the art gallery's courtyard, presumably because the janitors who usually picked it up were part of the strike. He'd started talking to a security guard and asked the man if he'd let us into the museum if we cleaned up beforehand. The guard was a black man who looked to be 60 or so, whose hand Bill shook warmly. Extending an arm toward me, Bill said, And this is Hillary, the girl I'm hoping to impress. And this is Hillary, the girl I'm hoping to impress. The guard's name was G Gerard. He and I also shook hands. The next thing I knew, Bill and I were striding around the courtyard, picking up discarded soda cans, cigarette stubs, and bits of paper and throwing them away. 
We were calling to each other as we passed in front of and behind an oversized bronze sculpture of a reclining human figure, and it was some of the strangest fun I'd ever had. Was I enjoying myself because it was a cool but sunny spring day and I was outside and moving around? Because everything about this afternoon was surprising? Because Bill was tall and silly and handsome and flirtatious? Their first fucking date was scabbing. Was crossing a picket line. <laughs> Why would you like this? Ha did this happen or is the author like that tone deaf that she made this up and thought it sounded cute and quirky? I don't know if it's fiction. Melissa asks, hi, Melissa. I don't know if I said hi. Hey, Nick. Uh, are you sure this is fiction? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know anything about fucking Hillary or Bill Clinton's life. I know a few things. I know the things people know about them. I don't know if their first date was crossing a picket line or sca doing scab labor in a fucking courtyard. And this is amazing. This is like insane. Not only that, I love the lead up to it. Oh, well, there's a, uh, the security guard was a black man, and we were willing to touch the black man. Uh, and then we did, and then we crossed a picket line. Elizabeth says uh, she remembers hearing this before. I remember hearing uh in or reading rather in the uh children's picture book where hillary calmed down quote calm down the striking students that's right calvin this author wrote american wife which is a fictional story loosely based on the life of first lady laura bush what if what if laura bush hadn't killed that person in a car accident is that what the story's about? That's cool. I love that this actually happened. This is this fucking rocks, man. This totally informed like their decisions about NAFTA and welfare reform. Uh it's great. Um is everybody is the stream okay for everybody? What's up, Casey? You won't have to wait long for some horniness, all right? <laughs> Skanda says, I just checked it. It's true. She admitted it. Tight. <laughs> Great. I'm glad. Okay, so um, we're getting like a little bit of a flashback here. Uh Unlike Mr. Gursky's observation that I was opinionated for a girl... Bruce's statement, okay, so Bruce was like an elementary school classmate that she had, uh, uh, what it, like school government, student government with when they're like, you know, elementary school age, six, seven, whatever. Um, Bruce, she like thought about Bruce, you know, fought, she was, had like a crush on Bruce when she was that age, right? She told him she liked him or she sent him a note that was like, uh, if you asked me out, I would say yes. Uh, and then Bruce never responded. And then she said, oh, did you get my note? And he was like, oh yeah, I like this other girl. And she was like crushed by it. And then she was like, I don't know. He said something like, I think you're a boy to her or something. Uh, unlike Mr. Gursky, who was an adult uh, who said she was opinionated for a girl, Bruce's statement that I was boylike had not been easy for me to dismiss. If anything, that had been delivered that it had been delivered without apparent animus made it more distressing. Even so, the lesson he offered proved to be one I needed to learn more than once. The lesson was this: You will encounter boys and men with whom you think you enjoy chemistry. 
A boy or a man will find you funny and interesting and smart, just as you find him funny and interesting and smart. The pleasure you take in each other's company will be obvious, but, crucially, while this pleasure will make you feel as if you're in love with him, it will not make him feel as if he's in love with you. He might remark on how much he likes talking to you, but there will be girls he wants to kiss, and you will not be one of them. This is like such incel shit. I love, this is like such nice guy, nice girl incel shit. Like this could have been posted on like our black pill. She will think you are funny. She will think you are smart. You will think that this is love. It is not. She will never hold your hand. She will never kiss you back. I love it. She's just going to like fucking... Instead of a yoga studio, she's going to spray down like the Yale crew team. <laughs> Ryan says hill cell. Jacob says fem cell. Um, yeah, in, I'm just, I didn't have this marked off to read, but just to, it keeps going. In high school and again in college, there were more Bruce's, Bruce stand ins. After hours or weeks or months of robust conversation, when I finally said or did something I considered overtly flirtatious, declared how handsome they were, or how lucky a girl would be to date them, or when I stood or sat close enough to kiss, tilting up my face, these boys seemed surprised and uncomfortable. This happened in high school with a boy named Norman, and it happened in my sophomore year at Wellesley with an MIT senior named Phil, and it happened again my senior year at Wellesley with a Harvard graduate student named Daniel. Again, these are my, these might all be real things. Uh, these might all be really like pulled from like Hillary Clinton's autobiography uh, or something like that. Uh, but it just it doesn't make her seem like healthy, mentally healthy. It like it makes her seem very uh, like like she's dwelling on this. <laughs> uh yeah, <laughs> Sicko Fox says Hillary is an alpha incel. She gets the military to do her her school shootings overseas. Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. She just she fucking took out all her like unrequited love on the nation of Libya. Uh, I just, I, so I think it's funny. Like, I don't, again, I don't quite know the purpose of writing this. I, I don't know because it starts off immediately with like Hillary is like the only nervousness Hillary ever feels is because she feels too competent. Like she feels apart from other people because of how brilliant and wonderful she is. And then we have her being like, bitter and resentful about her romantic life and then uh also <laughs> i mean i guess like if these are really items from hillary's past you have to include them if you're writing up to the point where hillary makes the choice not to end up with bill you have to include these so yeah, maybe they just don't think it makes her look bad. Maybe that's, you know, that's just part of liking Hillary is liking the scabbery and liking the the loneliness and the and the the bitterness. Okay, uh Prior to 2 days earlier, we had hardly spent time in each other's company, but with Bill's face so close to mine, waiting for my response. Are you guys ready, folks? With our bodies pressed together, it seemed that either of us might blurt out, I love you, that I was just as likely to do it as he was, and almost impossibly that it would be true. However, I love you wasn't what I said. Uh, I said, soberly I said, yes, I feel it too, because backing up here, Bill asked her, uh, I realized that uh, uh, if I introduce myself to you, I knew I'd be starting something that I couldn't stop. And so she said, yes, I feel that too. Yes, I feel that too. Uh, <laughs> Soon after that, we weren't talking much. We were kissing a lot. 
and removing the rest of each other's clothes, and his fingers were stroking me in different places, and I was overwhelmed with wanting to be as close to him as I could be. Him. Bill. A specific person. Y'all, y'all know that feeling when you want to be close to someone, like a specific person? With Roy, and with another law classmate named Eddie, whom I dated my first year at Yale, the sex had been enjoyable enough, but not personal. It had felt like we were doing pleasurable things that human beings did, in a fairly consistent sequence, but it hadn't felt relevant that I was specifically me. And the other person was specifically the other person. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just read something from Tyler that I don't know if I can repeat. Okay. Pokemon go in my holes is what Tyler said. Very good, Tyler. Uh, I love, like, it never felt important until now that uh, I was me. <laughs> Wait, I'm me? <laughs> Jimbo in the fucking... In, in the Quickie Mart with James Woods. Wait, I'm me? And then I could... Okay, here it goes. All right. Uh, and then I could feel the nudging of Bill's erection. It's bad. <laughs> it's so bad. The nudging of Bill's... Like... That's kind of not the way I I picture sex or like for like nudging like his dick is like an elbow. <laughs> I could f I could feel his his dick down there clearing its throat so to speak. <laughs> Bill's dick was gone. <clears throat> and it was like tilting its head down, like gesturing. Mm. Um, okay. I could feel the nudging of Bill's erection. It was probably... This is so bad. <laughs> it, it was probably going to happen. Then it was definitely going to happen. He was entering me, and I gasped. I gasped. I gasped, both because it felt so incredibly good and because I couldn't believe I was naked with this man. And then he really was inside me. It was happening. And we would eternally from this moment on be two people who'd had sex with each other. From this moment forth, we would always have been two people who had had sex. <laughs> there was no denying it. The sex had definitely happened, and it was us who did it. This, uh, Chris, Chris Morris asked, uh, how much money did this shit make? A lot of money, I'm going to say, Chris. Uh, that's getting turned into a Hulu series. Uh, I think a lot of fucking money was made by this thing. Yeah, Melissa asks, why does it sound like she's a passive passenger in her body? I think it has to do with the weirdly alien, like, way and, I don't know, focus of this book, which is a first-person fictional autobiography. <laughs> Kevin says, and I knew when we did the sex that sex had occurred. That's right. That's how you know, Kevin. <laughs> That's how you know when it happens. You're looking and you're waiting and saying it's probably going to happen. And then, holy shit, it happens. And then you're like, yep, that happened. Um, okay. <laughs> and then he really was inside me. It was happening. And we would eternally, from this moment on, be two people who'd had sex with each other. Even as he thrust into me, as I arched up against him and gripped his buttocks. Just imagine, picture Hillary Clinton and Bill doing this. Picture just, like, the architects of some of the worst, you know, uh... <sighs> Some of the worst things, both domestically and, and uh, <laughs> both in foreign policy and domestic policy. 
Picture picture her uh, arching up into him. And, and gripping his buttocks. There were a few seconds in which our eyes met and we looked at each other, both of us unblinking. That's how you know it's good sex when you don't blink. <laughs> you just like stare open-eyed at, at your lover. Um, neither of us was smiling. Smiling would have been trivial or beside the point. To be with him in this way was almost intolerable ecstasy. It was the most precious thing I had ever experienced. These are two demons. These are like two demons having sex, unblinking their eyes like fish, unsmiling, just uh, staring into each other, seeing uh, the future of the nation, the future of the globe. And um, yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kelly says they were exchanging long protein strings, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, folks. There's more. There's more uh, disgusting shit. Okay. This is like two pages later. Oops. I have my phone not on silent. The second and third times with Bill had been the same night as the first time. So there are two more sessions uh, that Curtis Sittenfeld is denying us in this writing. Just this this could have been much worse is what is what Curtis is warning us with. <laughs> That's a deep cut, Sicko. I like that joke. She's got that frazzle grip. Um, the second and third times of Bill had been the same night as the first time and the fourth and fifth times had been the following night also at my apartment and the sixth, seventh, and eighth times were at my apartment between 3 and 5 p.m. on a Wednesday <laughs> instead of my corporate tax class and that was when I stopped counting. Doesn't it sound like she's giving a statement to the police? Doesn't it sound like she's she's accounting for her whereabouts uh, while, like somebody else said, consummating uh, the birth of the Antichrist? <laughs> she's like reporting back to her satanic master about how many times they've copulated and the measures she's taken to ensure uh, in, in, ensure procreation. Oh, this part's great. I'm li these are just like paragraphs at a time, folks. Uh, like, I can't... We're already on page 59. And in 10 pages, uh, things are going to get good. That's not just a joke. That's true. But I read so much of this book for you guys. Okay. Uh, spoiler alert. We're only going to be covering the first half of the book today. I read 226 fucking pages of this book. All right? in like four days three or three or four days okay and it was enough for me i think i will do a part two we have to do a part two because hillary does run for president in 2016 in the third act of this book all right and i don't want to spoil too much but there's a twist there's a twist about who she's running against and who is on her side and that that should be a fun a fun read as well but there's this this shit's jam packed okay so next next section uh you play the saxophone hillary says <laughs> no i just left the case there to impress you it's empty lightly he flicked my clavicle with his thumb and middle finger of course i play you'll have to show me sometime i said and the next thing I knew, he'd bounded out of bed, and I was offered an unobscured view of his pale buttocks as he bent, opened the case, and pulled out the golden instrument. Which one? Still naked, he turned around, inserted the mouthpiece between his lips, and began playing, quote, When the Saints Go Marching In. Our eyes met, and I started to laugh, even as I worried what his roommates might think, or whether any of them would open the door to tell us to quiet down. 
but he t- continued playing and I continued laughing. He was laughing too while he blew on the mouthpiece. Now this is like my Antifa lover. This is like the level of sexual tension and, and sexual uh, electricity in my Antifa lover. He continued playing and I continued laughing. He was laughing too. Finally, he had no choice but to stop and give in to his laughter. I was then on my back, propped up on both elbows, and he put the instrument away and returned to bed. I can tell you're very impressed, he said. Your musical skills are dazzling. I leaned in and kissed him on the lips. I've never been serenaded by a naked man before. As he said. <laughs> This is even funnier reading it out loud. Like the first time I read it, I was like just shocked. I was like, I was just like in in uh, what what's the phrase she used? Uh, Intol nearly intolerable ecstasy. Uh, but reading it out loud is just so fun. Thank you everybody for for joining me for this. As he settled back in beside me, we kissed again and kept kissing. Now my mouth knew his mouth. This was becoming familiar and was, also, and was also still wondrously new. Then he pulled his head back an inch or two. He was regarding me with such warmth and affection, with such focus. I, lo- I love you, Hillary, he said. I'm in love with you, and I love you. I can't believe that you exist. That I exist? You're the Arkansas Renaissance man and future president. I looked at him more seriously. I'm in love with you, Bill, and I love you too. So, uh, yeah, Bill playing saxophone naked for Hillary. Like, we all knew he did. Um, we all knew that that was just part of who he was. Like, I think even when he's playing saxophone clothed, he just pictures that he's naked, except for the sunglasses, obviously. Uh, but I can't help but be reminded of the, you know, the Futurama joke about uh, Leela's previous boyfriend who would play uh, saxophone naked for her until she one day found the fibers of another woman's couch on his butt. Uh, and had to break up with him. <clears throat> yeah, Kelsey says they are so amazed by their own existences. That's like all this person knows how to write is just, I was him, and he was me, and I was me, and he was him. And we were Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, and we were having sex. And it would always be the case that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton had had sex. And it's like even kind of less imaginative than, uh, you know, a robot chicken episode or like uh, a a kid playing with their action figures or whatever. Uh, Because it's just like, I would love for this to be a musical. It'd be so good. Just Hillary singing about herself the whole time. Bill singing about Hillary. Hillary occasionally singing about how great Bill was. Okay, you guys ready for page 69? Everybody ready? Oh yeah, I also love that it was when the Saints go marching in. Is there like more of a a plebe song to play on saxophone that's like something you learn to play on a recorder right it's like that's like one step above hot cross buns dude can't play saxophone shut the fuck up
Okay, page 69 in the novel Rodham. And the truth was that when he was thrusting into me, I had such a strong sense of wanting him to come inside me, wanting no barriers between us, wanting the things we did with each other to be different from the things we did in the rest of our lives with other people. None of this was remotely like what I'd felt with Roy or Eddie. I'd regarded their semen as, if not disgusting, then at least as messy and mildly regrettable, like a spilled glass of water. This is all here. Like, you can't make it out, okay? But this is d literally on page 69. Literally, she's talking about how Bill's semen, Bill Clinton's semen was better than the other guy's semen. Um, this is sick stuff, folks. This, you guys should all just log off. Um, yeah, the tabs I made are from, uh, ripped up UPS info notices. Um, I w was trying to figure out how I was going to mark the pages and I didn't have any, uh, sticky notes. And then I realized that I did have sticky notes in the form of my info notices. Oh. So the other guy's semen was not good. It was not tasty or delightful. It was like a spilled glass of water mildly regrettable uh bill clinton's semen was like uh top sirloin it was like a filet mignon <laughs> thomas malone says glad she's letting everyone raw dog she talks about the pill like a couple times, never mentions a condom. It's never mentioned in here. When were when were condoms invented? Were they invented in 1969? Okay, so uh, fast forwarding here, uh, they've been together for like a year, maybe I don't remember. Um, they've moved across the country. I think, I don't remember why they're like living together. I think in California, I think Bill is like maybe working on a campaign or something like that. Like they're both wunderkind. They're both like, you know, have their, have their whole lives ahead of this. A lot of this book is kind of like endearing because it is about their relationship living together and being, you know, literati together and, and reading books uh, or, you know, uh, do, in, in doing other intellectual or artistic endeavors, you know, and sort of forging their life together. And, and that part of it is kind of, it's not necessarily well written, but it is like, uh, you know, romantic in, in the uh, larger sense of the word. Um, but they're in California. She's been working on something and she hasn't been around like during the day. And he's been making time like walking around San Francisco and shit. And she catches him making out with a girl like on a stoop in front of their shared apartment. <laughs> and uh, they go inside and she notices, uh, that the bed that she made this morning, their bed is all messed up. So Bill Clinton was like having fucking this girl in their bed. Okay. Uh, have you seen her before today? I asked. He sighed deeply and finally said a few times. How many? Four. Again, a silence descended on us. At last I said, this is such a betrayal. I waved a hand at myself, then him. I don't know what the point of this is. You'd throw away our love just like that? I'd throw away our love. I'll swear on my mamma's Bible that I'm passionately in love with you, he said. I'm a horny bastard, and sometimes I can't help myself. But there's no question that you're the love of my life. I want to be around you forever and ever. Then why the hell did you just have sex with that girl? He looked pained. For God's sake, I said. We did it last night, 
Am I not enough for you? He looked down and said, There's definitely something wrong with me. Because, yeah, you and I made love last night, and it was wonderful. And I could have done it again, right when we woke up in the morning. And again before you left for work. And again at lunch, and again now. It's the way I imagine it is for people who drink too much. It's a rarer moment that I'm not overwhelmed with how much I want to have sex than when I am. I'm thinking about doing it right now with you. Don't get your hopes up. That's not what I meant. I just meant it's constant. And I hate this about myself. My male urges. They make a fool of me. That's been true since long before I met you. But if I wreck what you and I have, I'd rather die. I did still feel furious and stunned with hurt, but I also felt some sl some slackening. Interesting word. He was telling me something that didn't exactly surprise me, but also wasn't something I'd known. I said, how long have you been like this? Since I was 10 or 11, I, he hesitated. As soon as I figured out it was a thing I could do, I touched myself a lot. And I mean a lot. Later, with girls, at first I was shocked any of them were willing to have anything to do with me. But I discovered they were. How many women have you slept with in your life? He bit his lower lip. Just to be clear, I said, if you tell me the truth right now, I might forgive you. And if you lie to me, I never will. I don't know the exact number, he said. It could be over 50. Did you cheat on your earlier girlfriends? Sometimes. If you're going to be evasive, you might as well pack your suitcase and start driving to New Haven tonight. I can fly back next week. It's not as if I need you here while I finish my job. I've never been faithful to any girl, he said. It felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach. He said, but from now on, I want to be faithful to you. I want to be worthy of your love. If you're saying that it's like a compulsion, how can you change that? With willpower, he said, and prayer, and with your help, if you'll give it to me. Does that mean us having sex three times a day? Maybe. What if, if I wanted it and you didn't? Would you think it was disgusting if I lay next to you and touched myself? I considered it, then said, No, I wouldn't think it was disgusting. Would it bother you if I looked at magazines? I need to think about that. It doesn't seem like it's my right to try to stop you, but I don't know if I want to see them. That's fair. Mapping out the future, coming up with, str with strategies and plans, these were things we were good at, things we'd practiced. In a way, strategizing made me feel as close to him as sex. Again, he took a few steps toward me, and when we were less than a foot apart, he dropped to his knees. He looked up at me, took both my hands, and said, The flesh is weak. Lord knows how weak my flesh has been. But Hillary, my spirit is yours. My soul, my spirit, and my heart. They'll always be yours, no matter what. And then he began to cry. And I don't mean he got choked up like he had at my parents' basement. This time, his face crumpled, and tears streamed down his cheeks in a way I'd seen my brothers in their, in their youth, but never in a grown man. Pulling his head toward my navel, it was instinctive, not a decision, as so much about Bill was for me instinctive. Still on his knees, he wrapped his arms around my waist and pressed his torso and face against me, and I petted his hair. I didn't reassure him that my spirit and soul and heart were his, because wasn't it obvious? Instead, softly, I said, Bill, oh, Bill, what am I going to do with you? This is fucked up. <laughs> I have a, I have a medical condition. I fuck too much. I, I always be fucking.
Lord knows you can't stop Slick Willie from fucking. <laughs> Truly cursed stuff. Truly, like, magnificently evil prose. On several levels. Just the content, uh, the the people involved, <laughs> and the writing. All adds up to something uh, that probably shouldn't be spoken aloud. I wonder what ancient horrors I'm going to resurrect by speaking this uh, aloud. As, uh, Tony, apparently, is one of those horrors. Want to see some uh, Tony Butthole? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, no. Well, I guess I've already read that stuff. You can eat it. Okay, we got to enter into a compromise. This is Tony's favorite position to be in. He loves like being cradled in my arm. So baby, such a little baby. <clears throat> Everybody's saying hi to you, Tony. Gowdy says, have Tony read a passage. Tony's too baby. He doesn't know how to read. Okay. Uh, is everybody, now that we had the Tony break, is everybody, um, we're approaching the break up here. Okay. The last page that I read was page 95. Uh, flash forward to 140. <clears throat> Okay, in the meantime, a woman, okay, so Bill was planning on running for state senate, I think, in Arkansas. No, maybe maybe federal senate, maybe the, the senate position in Arkansas. And a woman approached Hillary at a, at a uh, supermarket and said that Bill forced her, forced himself on her. She said no, and Bill, like, penetrated her still, okay? She wouldn't give Hillary the name uh, and left, right, without, like, Hillary being able to ask her questions or something. Hillary decided, like, not to believe it. Intr go figure, right? Um, kind of put it out of her mind. But there's like a lot more um, soul searching in this book or like, I don't know what you would call it, like que questioning internally, you know, um, than I think occurred in real life. Um, I don't, I think it's pretty charitable to devote as much time as this author did 
to Hillary like uh, contemplating her own husband's um, possible assaults, you know? Given Hillary's actions that we do know about. Okay. She had gone to visit her friend. Uh, she had flown to visit her friend. And this passage says, I checked my suitcase and walked to my gate. And I was trembling and nauseated. In the last seven months, I, haven't, I hadn't admitted it to myself. I had buried it, though. It turned out not permanently. But I believed that something had happened between Bill and the woman in Chateau's parking lot. And the reason I believed it was that she'd said he'd kissed her neck. Uh, so basically, like, Bill kissed Hillary's neck... Uh, and that's like, you know, I don't know, a tell, like that's like a, a, a trait or something that she can pick up, uh, from the woman's story. All right. So she confronts Bill about this again, something I don't think ever actually like happened. Something I don't think actually occurred in their relationship from everything I've read. As soon as like allegations came up against Bill Clinton, both Hillary and Bill and their entire campaign teams like turned their entire focus on discrediting the women who came forward about Bill. Which, again, I don't know why this book was written. I don't understand the purpose of writing this book because to write this book you already have to have like such a fawning relationship over Hillary just by what we've seen so far. Okay, go. Keep going. Yeah, you can go on the speaker over there. <clears throat> and yet you're kind of approaching... Okay, Tony's fucking with the light. Stop. Um you're kind of approaching a very touchy subject when it comes to your idol Hillary Clinton, which is the fact that she enabled and smeared like the uh, alleged victims of Bill Clinton. So why would you write a story where she doesn't do those things? <laughs> stop. Hey, stop. Is this, it seems like blasphemy to me. It seems like heresy to write something about Hillary Clinton where she didn't marry the serial abuser, allegedly, the the horn dog who was like willing to risk his own marriage and his own political career or whatever because he couldn't stop fucking people. I don't know how you're supposed to be able to address that with the pro Hillary crowd. Stop. Uh, Alexandria said this book wasn't written. It has always been here long before even the oceans were alive. I feel like that's a very good explanation. I feel like that's definitely a possible explanation for not only the cursed content, but just the, the, um, the nonsensical nature of its origin. But you guys will get what I'm saying. Like, I feel like so many Hillary supporters are like, she did what she had to do by supporting Bill Clinton. And, you know, she had to make tough choices, right? Wasn't one of her books called fucking Tough T Choices? Wasn't that her, like, presidential autobiography? Hard choices? Um, and for somebody to come along and say, wouldn't it be great if Hillary actually had believed women? And, like, stood up for herself in the face of, you know, uh, serial 
uh, what do you call it? You know, cheating on her. I feel like that's going to ruffle some feathers. Okay, so she she approaches Bill with this information. She's like nervous about it, but she finally has to like confront Bill with what she was told. Uh, he he glared at me. What's what's the point of all this? If you can't trust me, what are we doing? If I can't trust you, I repeated, and I could hear my voice rising, it's because you've done everything short of taking out a billboard telling me not to. You have no right to act like I'm paranoid when you're the one who betrayed me. I moved to fucking Fayetteville for you, and you can't even keep your pants zipped. There was something horrifying and refreshing in this bluntness. Since Berkeley, we had only talked about talked around the subject of infidelity. He said, It's interesting that you're so sure you're not the problem when plenty of people would think it's your expectations of me that are absurd. Kennedy had liaisons. LBJ had liaisons. Everyone knew it and just turned a blind eye. Maybe I'm a normal man, and maybe it's your self-righteousness that's the problem. You're not normal, I said. You're also not the president. And if you... And if you keep sabotaging me, I probably never will be. There it was, at long last, the allusion to the bribe money I'd prevented him from using. I, I sometimes question whether you have any ethical standards, I said. I'm not sure you do. Uh, so there was at one point where like somebody gave him a bag of money. And he was like, I'm going to send this to my campaign manager. And, she, uh, and then he didn't. Um, so I, I sometimes question whether you have any ethical standards. I'm not sure you do. You know what you are? He said, you're a smug bitch who drives people away because you think you're smarter than everyone else. Of course, you don't find it hard to be faithful when you don't have other options. There was just enough truth in these accusations, or at least enough of our deepest and most private fears about ourselves to truly sting. Neither of us spoke for close to a minute. Then I looked over and said, And you wonder why I don't want to marry you. I got out of the car and slammed the passenger side door, and he drove away with my suitcase still in the trunk. I like that she specifies passenger side door. You know, what if, what if uh, she was driving? And she had uh, slammed the driver's side door and then he had reached over uh, using his long arms uh, and pressed the pedal with his arm and steered with the other arm uh, and drove away. So I like this a lot. I like this passage a lot. I like that... Uh, Clinton is like, um, uh, maybe I'm just a normal man. You're an uptight bitch who can't understand when a guy needs to fuck down. I like that a lot. Um, and then I like her saying, you're not normal. <laughs> I like that a lot. Also, uh, you're also not the president which is uh, foreshadowing to a uh, future that won't exist within this book. <clears throat> yeah, Elizabeth says Bill is treated so gently in this book and it's infuriating. He really is. Like him calling her a bitch or whatever is like the the kind of harshest he's gotten to this at this point. At most he's just he's like sort of depicted as uh too gregarious and too like too much of a social butterfly for his own good and like he can't control it right later on in the book he becomes more of a pathetic figure uh there also has been like hints of him being too much of a politician and sort of like turning on the charm all the time or like being uh too controlling of a room you know t too like taking taking up the oxygen in a room so to speak uh but he, he's like basic like hillary is suspecting him of rape 
basically at this point. And he's still being fairly treated with kid gloves by the author. Um, so he, uh, he goes to her apartment, um, and he like apologizes to her. Uh, they both apologize to each other. He says, if I don't have you, I have nothing. We hugged and hugged and cried and cried. And then we had glorious sex. And when I was on top of him sitting up and both of us were close, but not finished, I said, I'll marry you. I want to marry you so badly. I love you so much. He smiled in exactly the way I'd anticipated. He said, do you really mean it? I nodded. Oh, Hillary, he said, oh, baby. He pulled me toward him so that we were closer without space between us, as close as we could be. The space between. Um, I love that she was like thinking he was like a, a sexual assaulter. And then he called her a bitch. And then she's like, this is the man I want to marry. This is this is it. Um, in the middle of the night, he woke me by tapping my shoulder. It sometimes happened that while I was asleep, he'd rub my breasts or below my navel, and at the slightest shifting toward him on my part, or when my breathing became ragged, he'd slide into me. Picture Hillary Clinton saying all this stuff. But in those circumstances, we didn't speak. And on this night, he was saying my name, asking if I was listening. <laughs> so he didn't want to have sex, so he made sure that I was conscious. He wasn't looking for, for sex, so he, he actually wanted to hear me say, uh, yeah, I'm awake. Uh, finally, I said, yes, yes, I'm listening. Uh, quote, I've never, ever forced myself on a woman. Never. Okay. And I never would. But you shouldn't marry me. You should leave. I'll drag you down. The thing that's wrong with me is incurable. Do you hear me? I love it. She's like, are you gay? And he's like, oh, I wish. What I have is a... Is, is this is a what I said what do I have is a condition so so irregular and so so disgusting uh, it's called fucking a lot it's called I'd say I fuck a lot uh, do you, the thing that's wrong with the thing that's wrong with me is incurable do you hear me my eyes had already feared filled with tears yes I said in the morning I'll try to talk you out of it but what I'm telling you now is the truth you know your rule about two reasons? One reason is you won't have the career you deserve here. And the other is that the problems I have will never go away. When I try to convince you to stay, it's me being selfish. Us staying together is good for me and bad for you. Bill, I said, baby. But I couldn't say any more. And it wasn't because I was too sleepy. It was because I was too sad. I wasn't too sweepy. I was too sad to say anymore. Uh, so she leaves. She gets in the car and she leaves. All right. Uh, part two, right, is called The Woman. What are, we, what are we doing on time here? How long has this been going? Where do I tell how long this has been? Oh, hour 14. Holy shit. Okay, we got f four or five tabs left. All right. Uh, uh, she was wondering why we'd broken up. Had it been the woman's accusation or Bill's warning? If I had believed that the woman and Bill had had some kind of physical encounter, did I believe that it had been against her will? On the Pennsylvania Turnpike, I understood suddenly that I was freed from deciding what I believed. If I was no longer his girlfriend and never his wife, I was not responsible for his behavior, not even by extension. This absolution was my reward for losing him. In the years to come, it sometimes seemed like only the only reward. As it happened, nobody ever asked me why Bill and I had broken up, even the people who'd expressed sympathy. 
Uh, so once again, the author is essentially implying that Hillary is partially responsible by extension for staying with Bill after the accusations, after uh, the frequent infidelities. This is a very weird book. It is like the author is trying to fix the one thing she doesn't like about Hillary Clinton. It's kind of what it seems like. Cuz now we're at the we're at the actual fictional part, right? Everything up to, you know, a few minutes ago has been the actual, you know, sort of like fictionalized biography, not an alternative fiction, but just a sort of like narrative uh what's what's the word? Like adaptation of her actual biography. This is where the actual like fiction, the 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 alternative timeline comes into play is when they break up. And they break up because of his infidelity and because of his possible, like, assault. <laughs> okay, we're jumping uh, way forward because I read, uh, this was the worst part, uh, from page 169 to 218, like, nothing happened uh, worth mentioning on the show. She, like got a job she talks about having sex a couple times over the years she works with a guy she kind of has a crush on but he's got a family they watch the clarence thomas hearings in the senate that is brought up as part of this book uh joe biden is not mentioned joe biden gets mentioned in passing when i believe hillary is taught hillary or another woman uh, is talking about like the old guard, right? No longer uh, are the old is the old guard going to control what we do. And I think Joe Biden is mentioned in passing, but his participation in the Clarence Thomas uh, hearing, confirmation hearings, and the grilling of Anita Hill, which is covered pretty extensively in the book like it's a it's a major point in the book that hillary is extremely interested in in the grilling of her joe biden isn't isn't uh really brought up in that so <clears throat> flashing forward bill clinton has been the governor of arkansas for uh several terms and now he is running for president. The year is 1992. Okay, so some people might notice some similarities between this timeline and ours. However, he's been married to a different woman. They have children. Uh, she is not the political firebrand or the uh, the the new woman that Hillary was at at this time, right? So they are literally her and. I think it's her and her uh, the the guy she has a crush on in her office, where she's a professor in Chicago, are watching the sixty minutes interview with Bill Clinton and his wife, where they address what are basically the Jennifer uh, what's her name Jennifer Flowers accusations that Bill Clinton and Hillary actually did address on 60 Minutes while he was running for president in 1992. Sarah Grace, who is the name of like Bill's wife in this timeline, sat on, and Bill sat on a pale love seat in a hotel suite in New Hampshire, and the interviewer faced them from an armchair. Over the interviewer's shoulder, a fire crackled in a fireplace. Sarah Grace wore the same style of dress she'd worn for Bill's announcement, this one light pink and puffy sleeved with a Peter Pan collar. She looked extraordinarily nervous as the interviewer began asking bill questions about the cabaret singer who's jennifer flowers if i if i'm not getting that name incorrect uh the cabaret singer how do you know her how would you describe your relationship sarah grace was unblinking and unsmiling 
Her outfit is way too little house on the prairie, Greg said. She should be wearing a suit. Okay, so Greg, it's not the guy she has a crush on. It's like her friend who's a DNC operative. Okay. He says her outfit is way too little house on the prairie. She should be wearing a suit. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, like maybe a mint green pantsuit, for example. That would be much better. I think a better woman would wear a mint green pantsuit while she sat next to Bill Clinton denying a 10-year-long affair with a server. <laughs> And they're sitting so far apart, I said. There were probably three inches of space between them. They need to present a united front. Greg says, he needs to let her speak for herself, she said. She should be saying all this, not him. Just then, the interviewer asked Sarah Grace if what Bill said was true, about like not being, you know, not cheating. Sarah Grace nodded. She said, I felt sorry for the woman. I winced. Unfortunate choice of words. In a soft voice, her eyes downcast, she added, I think Bill's been a wonderful governor for the state of Arkansas. Jesus Christ, I said. Did they not give her media training? She was so, there was no other word for it, weak. Bill needed an, Bill needed an equal who'd act like even if he'd had affairs, so what? because they were both sophisticated and tough. And the only person he was answerable to her was, the only person he was answerable to was her. And if she dealt with it, it was no one else's business. Hell, maybe she'd had affairs too. The American public would not, of course, like such a woman, but that didn't matter. He was the one running for office. And the reality was that a wife like that would probably win him sympathy votes. Yeah, um, this is amazing to me, okay? The interview ends terribly, right? The interview uh, ends with Sarah Grace, Bill Clinton's fake wife and this real wife in this timeline, crying on 60, 60 Minutes. I love Bill very much, Sarah Grace said in a quavering voice, and then she began to cry. Oh my God, I said, and Greg said, what a train wreck. Okay. So, spoiler alert, Bill Clinton drops out of the Democratic primary because his wife was too weak. The wife in this timeline who was not Hillary Clinton was too weak to support Bill Clinton's candidacy. And it's not presented as... It's not presented as, like, she didn't have the the fortitude to persevere even when, like, she was emotionally... Uh, what's what's like confused or or had emotional like uh ambivalence towards her husband's cheating like the argument here is that she should be a a, a hip bohemian metropolitan woman who has like accepted her husband's affairs and is willing to support him and say fuck the american people if you don't support my husband's infidelity but she's too weak to do that. So you're like kind of have the author is kind of having it both ways here by saying that Hillary like was her own strong woman by leaving Bill, but Sarah Grace is uh too weak to do what Hillary will will have done if she would have stayed with him. Yeah. <laughs> It's very weird. This is a very weird book. Uh, call a priest, Greg said. Someone needs to read the last rites to Bill Clinton's candidacy. Greg, I said, and he turned to look at me. I want to run for Senate.
Okay, so this is one thing I kind of skipped over. With the Anita, Anita Hill hearings, there was a senator, um, I'm forgetting what state it's from, Illinois, I guess, uh, Senator Dixon, a Democratic senator who is going to vote to confirm uh, Clarence Thomas despite like him being a Republican nominee and despite, you know, Anita Hill kind of getting steamrolled, uh, you know, in, in these confirmation hearings. And so the Democratic strategist, Greg, her friend here, thought it would present an opportunity for Hillary to primary him as a tough woman, you know, in the wake of this Anita Hill scandal that a lot of women were, you know, animated by and uh, to a degree radicalized by. Um, however, another woman had already announced her candidacy to primary this uh, Senator Dixon, a woman by the name of Carol Mosley Braun. This is a female African-American woman who in real life goes on to be the first black female senator in America. She wins the primary against Dixon in real life and becomes the first female black senator in America. In this book, Hillary Clinton has Hillary Rodham, excuse me, has decided to run against Carol Mosley Braun because uh, Clinton like flamed out on 60 minutes and it gave her enough gumption to challenge the first, you know, what would become the first black female senator. Okay? And this reminds me very strongly of Again, that picture book that had her like calming down the striking students. There's another passage where it says something like it was a man's world until Hillary Clinton came along. And it shows a timeline of like notable men, except the men are people like Albert Einstein, a Jew who had to flee Nazi Germany and Jackie Robinson the first black man in American baseball. <laughs> and despite their best efforts, Hillary Clinton was able to succeed. And that's what this reminds me of. This is even worse than that, in my opinion. Because she calls her friend Gwen, who is a black woman, Gwen was, of course, one of the first people I called. I said, there's been a happy, there's been a happy change of plan. I'm running for Senate. Gwen said, what about Carol Mosley Braun? Her campaign has a very serious problem, and she might, she might well drop out before the primary. I thought it was realistic that she could be, if I thought it was realistic that she could be elected, I wouldn't challenge her. Gwen says, my friend at the Rainbow Coalition told me she's a media darling and is raising lots of money. Yes and no, I said. Apparently her campaign manager is bad news. And Carol is flaky in terms of her schedule. I witnessed it myself at an event. I just don't think she can go the distance. Gwen says, uh, why don't you wait and see? And if she doesn't, you can run next time. The momentum following the Anita Hill stuff if Carol isn't going to capitalize on it, someone else should. I was unprepared for the steeliness in Gwen's tone when she said, You haven't convinced me, Hillary. The idea that her campaign is troubled. That sounds like a justification for you doing what you want to do. This reminds me. That's not, it's not necessarily bad writing, but it reminds me of the conversation that uh, Lisa has in the room, in the movie The Room with her friend. Where her friend is like, wow, wow, Lisa, you're so, you and I are so different. You're like cheating on Johnny and bragging about it. Uh, that's what this conversation <laughs> reminds me of, except Lisa in this case would be like our protagonist, uh, Hillary Rodham. <laughs> um, the idea that her campaign is troubled, that sounds like a justification for you doing what you want to do. Just to be clear, I said, this isn't about race. 
Well, sure, there was an edge to Gwen's voice I hadn't heard, even when she tried to convince me not to move to Arkansas. This isn't about race for you. Uh, that's the end of the, her conversation with Gwen. Doesn't need to uh, <laughs> smooth anything over, apparently. There's no mention of the primary contest at all. All right? It cuts to... Once I had won the primary, the general election, given the political makeup of Illinois, was a foregone conclusion. So she just, it's just like, of course I won against the black woman who was, who was late. She had, she had uh, poor manners and was late. And of course I won. And this has nothing to do with race. Um, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's almost the end of part two. There's two more paragraphs. So James, we haven't talked about James. James was the guy who was her coworker who she was having like an emotional affair. He was having an emotional affair with her because he was married and had kids. Um, but like all they did was hug and hold hands and like, he would cry while they were hugging and stuff. And that, that part all has to be fictional because that's the, in her, you know, in, in, in 1992 and shit, when she's not married to Bill Clinton, but it's very weird. Like they, I don't think they even ever kiss. Um, but so we're flashing forward to, Oh, she told James that they couldn't continue if she was going to run for Senate because they could even, even like though they're not actually cheating, it couldn't be known that like she was hugging a coworker for that long, I guess. Um, and so he like cried and stuff or whatever. Uh, flash forward. When James committed suicide in December, 1993, 11 months after I'd been sworn in as Senator, I don't believe that it was because I'd broken his heart. I don't believe a person takes his life unless he has serious underlying mental health issues. I will always feel a terrible sadness that James hanged himself from a beam in his family's basement. I suspected it was intentional that he did it on a morning when a house cleaner was there so that it was she rather than Susie or David who found him. I learned of James' death after returning to my Senate office from voting on a transportation bill. My colleague Eli from the law school had left a message. <clears throat> Elizabeth asks, does this author actually hate Hillary? That's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. Ryan Tennant says, hashtag Clinton body count. Just another one of the victims uh, of, a, of an apparent, quote, suicide uh, in, in the proximity of Hillary Clinton. In the orbit of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I don't think James killed himself because of me. I think he was crazy. I think he was a crazy person. Um, so this is amazing. Uh, just to reiterate what we've learned today. Uh, in this alternative timeline, Hillary, Hillary couldn't stay with Bill because she suspected him of rape uh, and couldn't like tolerate the multiple infidelities. <clears throat> she also uh, ran a Senate campaign and beat the person who in our timeline would become uh, the first black female senator in America uh, and also a former like friend and romantic uh, interest uh, killed themselves when, when she spurned them. <laughs> and also she likes Bill, she liked Bill Clinton's come for a while there um that's th you understand like why we could only do parts one and two part three is called the front runner okay and just as a tease next week i'll probably do another live stream finishing this off the first page in the part three uh which is called the front runner says American presidents and vice presidents elected 1988 to 2012. 
1988, George H.W. Bush and Dan Quayle. 1992, George H.W. Bush and Dan Quayle. Remember Bill Clinton, uh, his wife was too weak to win him that election. 1996, Jerry Brown and Bob Carey. 2000, John McCain and Sam Brownback. 2004, John McCain and Sam Brownback. 2008, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. 2012, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. But 2016 is not listed here. So it's interesting that she made Jerry Brown, uh, the Democratic president who followed George H.W. Bush, a one-term Democratic president, as opposed to George H.W., being a one-term Democratic president. And then John McCain instead of Bush. I don't know why that happens. Uh, you would think since George H.W. Bush had a more successful presidential run than in our timeline, his son would be even more primed to become president in the year 2000. Uh, not sure about that. So if you can't wait to hear what happens uh, in 2015 and 2016 in this timeline, uh, tune in next week. Well, we, we will do another exploration of the fascinating alternative timeline known as Rodham. <clears throat> this is going to be an HBO, or sorry, Hulu miniseries how how are they going to like shit talk Bill Clinton this much in the miniseries how are they going to like they're going to have to gloss all over that if there is no like penetration in the Hulu miniseries I won't watch it I won't watch it at all uh, thank you so much to everybody for sticking around this one ran pretty long but it was uh very fun uh, i appreciate all you folks um yeah if uh there will be a free episode of meaning death cult this week okay we're gonna do it we're gonna do it we're not gonna fuck it up this time as far, I've, I've been told that it's a hulu thing i've been told and I think I even saw that. I think I even saw it on the internet when I was looking for an image to put up next to my head on the live stream. Pretty sure it's going to be an actual thing. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Love you guys.